Hello. So the, uh, the standard commitment to work at the Humanitarian Suicide Hotline is uh, six months. They ask you to volunteer for six months. And then that's when most people sort of wrap it up and move on. Uh, not many people last longer. Few people like hang in there and last a year, um, but six months is the qualifying time. Um, I was a volunteer there for four years uh, because I'm an idiot. Um, and I originally vo volunteered when I was 20 something, you know, when you're 20 something and you know, I, I had hope. I thought I'd, I believed in things. And um, you know, you get older and you'd you lose it or you just think, eh, who cares? But <laughs> the thing I believed in is I, I wanted to be a therapist. I thought I would be a good therapist. I thought I was good at listening to people. I thought that was my, what I wanted to do. Uh, but you know, I, I thought, or even a psychiatrist, I thought maybe I'd go to medical school, but first I needed to go to, at the very least I needed to go to graduate school. And at the time I was a 20 year old uh, sophomore at Queens College, um, a prestigious Ivy League University, um, at <laughs> state school in New York. And uh, I had a GPA of two point, just two point. And so to get into grad school, I needed some sort of like work credit internship type thing. So I needed to volunteer somewhere. So I thought I'll, I'll volunteer at a suicide hotline. I, I saw a poster and I called up and got the woman on the phone and she, you know, I sound like I sound now. And so she was worried about me and I eventually <laughs> talked her into letting me volunteer. So I went to a church in New York where I lived at the time uh, on the Upper West Side. Uh, at about 8 a.m. on a Saturday for this orientation. And you walk into the church and there's like 60 people, just like all different, like New York, you know, just a melting pot of people, just different ages and weights and ethnic groups and si just all types of people. But right away, I see a guy that's clearly the guy in charge of the suicide hotline. He's, uh, he's sort of like gray haired, like hippie turned a little corporate, you know what I mean? He's got his like, like his plaid shirt, but it's tucked into his khakis, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sitting on a desk and he's dipping a, a chamomile tea bag into an NPR coffee cup. <laughs> I mean, I know who this guy is. Um, and he starts off by saying like, hey, all right, thank you all very much for coming. My name's Glenn, really appreciate it, namaste. Listen, <laughs> even though we're meeting in this church, right, these good Presbyterians lent it to us, it's really nice. I just want you to know we're not affiliated with any sort of God or any sort of like religious agenda. So if that's why you're here, this isn't gonna be for you. And as soon as he said that, this one dude in the back just got up and walked out. <laughs> but I was like, that's fine with me. I don't believe, period. Uh, so, so it's fine, it's fine. Um, and he's like, great. Another th reason we're here, and just I want us to get out of the way, is that we have to be, uh, we wanna be anonymous. Don't, don't get to know each other. We have to be what is called intimate strangers. Right on, check that out. <laughs> cool. Um, and what he meant was, uh, intimate strangers means you have to be anonymous for a couple different reasons. One, for the callers, because it's being an anonymous person that makes people call a hotline, right? Because they can't talk to family, friends, people you know, because we all have agendas. We all have good agendas sometimes, but we all have things we want from the other person. Whereas when you call a stranger, you can be more clear because you don't know what they're thinking or who they are or their values or their thoughts. So you can be more comfortable to express yourself. And so if you get too personal, that, that ruins that. The other reason to be anonymous is for the, for the volunteers, because we were a suicide prevention hotline, but you can't prevent suicide. You, you can do your best and you can listen and you can be there, but we weren't there to prevent necessity. If people felt so strongly or their lives were so in such a place, if they had you know, diseases, whatever their thing, we were there to be with them no matter what choice they made. We were not there. To and that's hard for people to understand because there's people out there who feel so strongly in the sanctity of life that they'd be willing to kill to preserve the sanctity of life. Um, or as Glenn would say, lunatics, right? <laughs> um, and so because of the anonymous, we had to have uh, three digit numerals to replace our last name. So it's like, take your last name, just take your last name. Uh, this was this was Glenn. Um, just take take your surname, as they say in London, right? Check that out, and just hold it in your hand and then throw it away. <laughs> Where's it going? I don't know. And now replace that with a three-digit numeral. Okay, check it out. Like call me Glenn One O Nine. And I remember thinking, okay, I understand your point, but you. We're all here to help. Like all these volunteers, all these people came in on a, you know, early on a Saturday to volunteer, maybe lighten up a little bit, maybe, you know, be more welcoming to us. But he didn't. Uh, he got even tougher as the thing went on because 
Um, as soon as the training class started, like people were dropping like pretty regularly. Like there was this one woman in the back who was falling asleep during the, the, the training part. She was asked to leave. There was a dude who was drinking a 40 of, of, uh, of malt liquor uh, at, at 8 a.m. on a Sunday, gone. Uh, there were these two dudes from Queens who kept saying, douchebag, they were asked to leave. <laughs> There was this really nice Asian dude, but he didn't speak English. He couldn't, he wasn't gonna be able to work on the phones. Um, so we kindly asked him to leave. Um, I didn't, but Glenn did. And, uh, and then the second part of the training class uh, is like where Glenn, I think Glenn, like a lot of people, is a wannabe actor. You know, a guy who never, didn't work out, and so he did this. And I know that because we would do these mock phone calls where we would sit at these desks. And so like one of the volunteers would sit at one end and Glenn would sit at the other. And then he had these binders with transcripts of actual calls. And then Glenn would get very into these characters as we did these phone calls. And I remember the first one asked to leave during this part was this woman who was helping Glenn, who was pretending to be this older Jewish woman on the Upper West Side who was, you know, she was older and she was a shut-in and a lot of her friends had died. And, um, uh, and I remember this, this woman helping her said, well, maybe if you let Jesus Christ into your life to this Jewish woman, so she was asked to leave. <laughs> And the last one in this part was this, uh, Glenn was pretending to be this older guy uh, who was, uh, not, not older, but middle-aged, uh, older to me then, but my age now. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> not funny. Um, and so, but the, but, but Glenn was pretending to be this guy and it was during sort of the end of the, uh, like, you know, the AIDS epidemic in New York. And so this guy was HIV positive and he just lost his lover. And um, this, this guy helping him said like, well, that's very sad, but you did choose this lifestyle. Gone. Then the third and uh, last part of the thing is where, uh, you know, a few more people got weeded out. Because Glenn was definitely this like hippie sort of, you know, academic turned corporate, but he also had like a Jewish metrosexual Louis Gossett Jr. drill sergeant thing because <laughs> he was weeding people out left and right. And the last part, he's like, we're gonna rap. Um, not like cool, like hip hop rap, not you know, like, like 70s white, sit around a circle and talk, rap, um, play guitar and talk about our feelings. And what he was looking for was uh, people who uh, were suicide survivors or people who had survived suicide. And what that is is suicide survivors are people who are left behind, people whose friends or, or family or people they are acquainted with um, killed themselves and they're left, they survive. And then there's um, people who survive suicide, people who have tried to commit suicide who you know, didn't uh, succeed, um, but they're, they're, they have that. As Glenn would say, like, yeah, check it out. You need to befriend yourself. You can't befriend other people here. Thank you. Gone. <laughs> at the end of two weeks of training, out of 58 people who came in to volunteer, four of us made it to the phones because Glenn was really good at his job. He was really good. But I can tell you guys right now, I was better. Because what Glenn didn't know was that two years before I worked at the hotline, I lived in San Diego, California, a miserable place, and um, <laughs> racist. And uh, I was in love with this girl, Tracy. Uh, Tracy was like a goth, you know, you dyed black, you white, you, she was addicted to meth. Um, and she would try to do the meth and never be satisfied because that's addiction. And I would try to do Tracy and never be satisfied. And we'd be in that circle of spiral of sadness and we'd both go down. And eventually I got so low, uh, I was 19, I, I was in Tijuana with, it, uh, with her and my best friend Babyface, this guy who looked like Morrissey, so we called him Babyface. Um, and Babyface told me that he slept with Tracy. My best friend slept with the girl I was in love with. And I couldn't handle it. I didn't know what to do with it. I, didn't, I just didn't know where to put that. And I, I just sort of felt like I had had it. And uh, Glenn didn't know that I then jumped in my five-speed puke orange VW Fastback, the best car I've ever had. And I drove to my father's house in Del Mar, California. My father's a retired New York City cop who became a lawyer because he's on the wrong side of everything. And <laughs> he, uh, but he was on vacation with his newer, better looking, younger family. And uh, I broke into his house and I went into his garage where he keeps his gun in a lockbox and I pried it open with a screwdriver and my father has a 38. I don't know much about guns because I read books, um, but I know it was like the kind where you put the bullets in like in Deer Hunter and you, you know, like that kind, as opposed to like the wire where you put the clip in. So when I say books, I mean TV shows and movies. Um, and, uh, and, 
it doesn't, I know it doesn't have a safety and it has a trigger and so I just put the bullets in and I, I kept the, 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 the hammer down so it wouldn't, it, it was still, the safety was on. I put it in my pocket, I went to my dad's house and I got a bottle of tequila. My dad doesn't drink, but he has five alcoholic kids. He's an enabler. And I took a bottle of tequila, the gun, and I got my uh, Pugh Orange VW Fastback and I drove less than a mile from my dad's house to Torrey Pines, Torrey Pines State Beach, which is a beautiful beach. Sat in my car and I took the bottle of tequila and I just drank half a bottle of tequila in one sip. Just till I felt that warmth that warmth that comes from tequila, and I just sat there and I got the nerve up, and I loaded the gun, and I pulled the hammer back so you can just sort of tap it and it goes off, and I took the gun and, uh, and I shoved it in my mouth. And I'll bet you Glenn has no idea how, how good that feels, how good it feels to take a gun and stick it in your mouth like that, and to think, I have control of this, I don't have control of many things. I don't have control of a lot of things. I don't have control of anything, but I can control this. I can control the end. I can control this one thing, and that feels good. Even now, saying it, like right here now, I mean, things are okay, don't worry. But, I mean, they're not great, but they're okay. But they're, <laughs> but even that felt, it just, it just felt very good, and I bet you Glenn doesn't know that, and I had the gun, and I know I was gonna do it. I was close, this was not, this was not a false, I was there, I, I know that. The, th the problem is, uh, tequila, uh, I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not like a tequila, like I want to be like a man, like I want to be like Bukowski or Hemingway or Muhammad Ali, like I'm not, like on the scale of men, like those guys being here, like I'm Dr. Phil, you know what I mean? Like that's, um, so what happened was I, uh, I threw up <laughs> on my suicide gun, <laughs> like a lot, and, uh, there's something about that that snaps you out of that moment. Um, and it did, it, like the absurdity of it, the, the, just the, the, the joke, the cosmic ridiculousness of it sort of snapped me out of it. And I realized like, that's not me, that I'm not the guy who pulls the trigger, which I needed to find out that way. And so I like put the gun back and I put it under my seat. I wiped the puke off me and uh, I went outside in Torrey Pines, which is a beautiful beach. Um, if you've ever been there, it's like a covey sort of thing. There's often dolphins in the water. There was a beautiful full moon that night and I went into the water and just, it was freezing because it's the Pacific. It's not a hospitable water. And um, <laughs> I went in there, but it was beautiful. It was a beautiful night and I was in the waves and I realized that that in the water, that that's, that's what it is. That's what life is to me. It's that it's terrible, it's hard. It's hard for everybody for different reasons and it's all relative, but it's hard. But then it's okay. And then it's hard and then it's okay. And there's every once in a while, there are those beautiful, perfect moments, which that night was, where I was in the water where I just had this feeling of like, this is a perfect moment and this is okay. And that's enough. Just those perfect moments are enough. But Glenn never knew that because I never told him. So at the end of two weeks of training, out of 58 people, four of us make it to the hotlines. Um, as Glenn would say, oh, check it out, you're my fab four, right on. <laughs> Speaking of the Beatles, did you know that Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, he killed himself? <laughs> All right, so he, see, he tells us that when we go into the phone room that first day, he wants to remind us of the most important thing, that at the heart of all suicide is strong ambivalence. People most often don't want to do it. People do it because it gets to be too much. In fact, he, this is what he said. He said, if anyone ever says anything to you close to the idea of, I don't want to die, but I want the pain to stop, that's, that's a warning sign. That's as close as we get to having a sort of bell go off. And that's what you need to pay attention to. All right, go have fun. And you walk in there and you're like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm sc you're scared that you're going to pick up the phone and be responsible for somebody else's life, right? Like you feel like you're going to get that call from the teens who are in the car with the music blasting and the gas coming out, just like they're in love. It's, but it's not, it's not, life's not a Radiohead. That's literally a Radiohead song I just described. It's not, <laughs> that's not life. Um, most of the calls are like weird, crazy people and sad people. It's a free phone in New York that somebody will listen to. You get a lot of weird, crazy people. A lot of times you'd answer the phone and you'd be like, you think you have problems? You know, I, I didn't do that. But you would think... I was a good humanitarian and I did exactly what Glenn said, which is to answer the call, be an active listener, say humanitarians, can I help you? Then be an active listener. If the call goes silent, don't be scared by silences. Um, if it gets to be like two or three minutes, you sort of don't get manipulated. If, it, you know, if, the, if it's quiet for five minutes, hang up. But, but as Glenn would say, silence is a form of communication, right on. See that, see what we just did? Um, 
The call should wrap up at about 20 minutes, but at 20 minutes, you sort of end the call. And the way you ended a call is you evaluated a caller's level of suicide. And the way you do that is you ask a series of four questions. If they say yes to any of the questions, you go on to the next one. If they say no, you stop and you thank them for calling and tell them they can call again. The questions are, do you feel so bad today that you think about suicide? If they say yes to that, then you say, do you have a plan for how you would do it? Then you say, do you, if they say yes to that, have you set a time for when you're gonna do that? And the last question is, have you taken any steps today to kill yourself? In the four years I worked there, 99.9% .9 of the calls were yes, no, 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 no. Because everybody thinks about suicide, all of us. In some way, we've all been affected. If it's a song, if it's a movie, or if it's someone you know, we all have thought about it. Not that many people go to the other three. Uh, the hotline, just to give you a quick thing about the way it looks. There's three desks, there's phones, landlines. Back when I worked there, there was, uh, there's plants. There's a coffee machine. There's a couple phone numbers on this wall that have like poison control, GMHC, uh, Covenant House for runaway teens, uh, Glenn's home number in case you need to call him, 911, in case you forget that the number for 911 is 911. Uh, there's some regular caller boards here for like regular callers who call a lot. And then on this wall is a big sign that says, shut up and listen. And that's the motto of the hotline, the motto, shut up and listen. And that's amazing. And that is why I stayed there for four years, because that is a very uh, profound sentiment, because we don't do it. We don't listen to each other. We can't. We all have our own thoughts. But to be able to do that for other people is an amazing feeling. And it makes you feel good for two reasons. One, you know, I don't know if there's really any way that we're help people or if we're all doing it for our own. I, I don't, you know, that's a philosophical sort of question, but it does feel good to help people. And then the other reason is you listen to people and sometimes it does make you feel like, you know what, I have to put things in perspective. My life isn't so bad. It's like, I said, it's like going to a park and if you see a squirrel and you think, well, at least I'm not a squirrel. <laughs> That's probably not the right reason. <laughs> All right, so uh, end of the training thing, 58, four of us, I worked there for four years. My last night, I get called in for the overnight shift. I come in, it's an overnight shift is from 11 at night to uh, eight in the morning. And there's you know usually three people, but there's only two of us this night. Me and this guy, Adam, Adam 474. Adam was a communist, it's not relevant to the story, but <laughs> you're welcome for the details. And the calls are busy till like 4 a.m., right? The phones are busy 4 a.m., the bars start closing, it starts slowing down, and sometimes you get a call every 15 minutes, which means if you're alternating, there's a half hour before you have to answer a call. And sometimes there's a little cop there, you'll get a nap. And around four, I guess it was like a quarter after 4 a.m., the phone rings, and it was Adam's turn to answer it, but he was nodding, he was at his desk like doing that like baby like in the back of a car or <laughs> heroin addict, it's the same thing. Um, just sort of, you know, and so I was like, I'll, I'll answer it. So I answer the phone, I'm saying, humanitarians, can I help you? And this very young, cute voice comes on the phone and says, uh, hi, my name's Amy. I was just calling, I was hoping to talk, and I was feeling a little sad. I said, hey, Amy, uh, this is Brian, what's going on? She's like, I don't know, um, I feel sad, but my grades at school are okay. She was going to NYU, and so that's not it. And I have a good relationship with my parents. They don't always get it, but I know they love me, so that's not it. I have friends. She described she had good friends at school. She described two types of friends. I always like this. She's described she had movie friends, and then she had bar friends. And I thought, that's nice. I would like to someday have some movie friends uh, in my life. <laughs> I look forward to those days. And so I was like, okay, well, that all sounds nice, but you said you were feeling sad, and that's not it, so what is it? And she goes, I don't know. She goes, that's the thing is, I don't know that some days I just feel this thing. And I was like, well, what's going on when that's happening? And she's, she said, well, she, she didn't know that on any given day she would have a really good day. And she, she knew she wanted to duplicate that. So the next day she would try to control it. She would wake up at the same time. If that day she like showered, then had her coffee, she'd repeat that, try to control all the things she could. But then sometimes, despite doing all that for no reason at all, she would just feel what she described as this hand come from behind her and just push her down. And I said, okay, what's going on when that happens? What are you thinking about? And she started to laugh. And I was like, what's so funny? And she goes, I don't know, I feel stupid. This is stupid, calling a hotline stupid. I don't believe in depression. I mean, there are people who are depressed, she said, that she knows that there are people who are clinically or socially or whatever it is, but she didn't feel like she was. She feels like there's a privilege aspect to some depression and that like people, you know, she said in Rwanda, we could say Syria, that there are people like, who are, have real problems and they're not depressed, they're just trying to survive, so what right do I have? And I feel that way often. I feel like, yeah, I didn't get out of bed for four days, but it doesn't mean I'm depressed. And 
I said, I understand what you're saying, but it sounds like you're going through a hard time. She goes, I don't know, this, I, I, this is stupid. And then when she started to laugh again, I started to laugh with her. And now, I don't, this is weird and I don't want to be inappropriate, but it felt like we were kind of flirting a little bit on the phone. Like there was that like weird, like, I, I'm not even flirting. I just felt like we connected in a way that she was similar to me. And that maybe if I had met her in another place, she could be a movie friend. But the call had sort of reached 20 minutes and I needed to wrap it up. And right when I was about to wrap it up, something changed. Uh, her voice, she started slurring her words a little bit. And I said, Amy, what's going on? She goes, look, I, I know it's stupid and I know it's selfish, um, but I can't, I can't do it anymore. I was like, what do you mean you can't do it? She goes, look, I don't want to die, but I want the pain to stop. And then I, that's Glenn's warning sign. I said, Amy, do you feel so bad that you think about suicide? And she said, yeah. And I said, do you have a plan for how you would do that? Uh-huh. Have you set a time? She said she had. And I asked her if she had taken any steps to kill herself, and she said she did. And I asked her what she did, and she told me that she took some painkillers, and I asked her how many, and she said 20. And I asked her what kind, and she told me, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And I asked her how long ago, and she said an hour. And I asked her if she'd been sick, if she'd thrown up, she said no. I asked her if she'd been drinking, she said she had a couple drinks. And then I threw my pencil at Adam to wake him up, and I told him to cut his phone off, which he's supposed to do, and he turned his phone off, and I gave him the information so he could call poison control, so he can get me some information, so I could give it to Amy. And I just tried to keep her talking, and I asked her what was going on. And she started telling me this weird story about when she was a kid in Tennessee, where she was from, and she went to this park with her parents, and it was a nice day, and they had ice cream. And I was like, great, what kind of ice cream? But I'm thinking, what am I talking, like, why am I talking about, like, it's an insane conversation to have about ice cream. By then, Adam had come back, and he gave me the information, and I told Amy, I said, hey, um, given all you told me about what you took and how long ago, do you realize you could, you, you could die within an hour? And she said, I, I don't know. And she started crying. I was like, Amy, I can help you, but I can only help you if you tell me you want help. And she said she did. And I was like, great, where do you live? And she told me. And I wrote it down, and I gave it to Adam to call 911. And I kept her on the phone, but she was kind of coming in and out. And then she was kind of mumbling. But then finally she said strawberry ice cream. She was asking, answering my question about what kind of ice cream it was that she had with her parents. And I was like, great, uh, tell me more about that. And she didn't. She didn't say anything for three or four minutes and then 10 minutes. And I'm supposed to hang up, but you know, who would? And then it was about 15 minutes and I heard some like banging on the door and I heard the door crack open and I heard footsteps and then somebody picked up the phone and said, it's okay, we've got her, click. And then I did what you're not supposed to do in that situation. What you're supposed to do is stay at the hotline. Glenn's supposed to come in or call you, and you're, he's to brief you to make sure you're okay. But I didn't. I left. I left the hotline, never went back, went home to my grandmother's house in Bayside, Queens, where I lived, and I went crazy, and I drank a lot of coffee, and I smoked cigarettes, and I drank, and I stayed up for three straight days trying to find out what happened. It was pre-internet, but I looked on the news and the radio, and finally, after three days, uh, in the Daily News, on page 23, I found an article that said um, that they had found the body of a 20-year-old NYU student named Amy Walters dead in her apartment, and that she had died of an accidental overdose. And I know why they say that. I know why they say accidental. There's religious reasons, there's stigmas, they don't want an epidemic at school. There's lots of reasons, insurance. I get it, I don't agree with it, but I understand that. But what I didn't understand or what I didn't know until that moment was that she had died and that I was the last person to talk to her. Not her mom and dad in Tennessee, not some boy or girl at school who had a crush on her but never told her, me. And the thing is, this is a long time ago now, you know? This is going on 20, over 20 years, 25 years. And the reason I tell this story and the reason I think about her all the time and I do. I've had bigger personal tragedies in my life. We all have. If you live long enough, you do. I talked to her for less than an hour 20 years ago. But the reason I think about her is because she's me in that car if I pull the trigger. There's no, she's exactly where I was. And the only difference is that she never got to find out what I got to find out, which is that it is hard. Life is rough. It's terrible. But every once in a while, there are those perfect life moments 
And that's enough because it has to be. Thanks. Thanks.